For many Baltimoreans over the age of 30 or 35, this is a familiar sight. An electric trolley which provided transportation for Baltimoreans for about 80 years. But on November the 3rd, 1963, this car, number 7407, of the number eight line from Towson to Catonsville, made its final run. It was the end of an era, the era of the electric trolley in Baltimore. Well, that's great as far as the covered trolleys go, George, oh, yeah. but how about the other trolleys, like the old open-air trolleys back here? Well, since I'm an expert on lasts, I, uh, I figured out that this uh, Riverside car, River, River View car, view car yeah. ran last in 1927. I guess we better get this one. It's the last one for 106 years. We better get on board then. You've got last this and last that, George. Where do you get the idea to write a book about them all? Well, nothing had been done about uh, about lasts. Everybody writes about firsts yeah. because they're interesting and innovative. But lasts are very nostalgic. You know, like there are a lot of people now that uh, are still living who would, would get a kick out of being on this car because it represented, uh, you know, a great moment in their past. George, how'd you track a lot of these things down? Just make them up? Well, a lot of them make them up. <laughs> no, you don't do that with a book of research. Uh, you take what the defense gives you. A lot of, uh, I just kept going through all these indexes and, uh, and encyclopedias and, and uh, you know, gradually the research collected. I, I had a very subtle method. I would wait till the research was a foot high before I knew I had a chapter, and then I, that would be my <laughs> chapter. If I didn't get a, a foot of research, then, uh, you know, the hell with it. George is no overnight success. He began writing when he was in high school, but he was not an immediate hit. In fact, he worked at a number of jobs, including one here at Channel 13. George was a cameraman for five years, shooting programs like The Buddy Dean Show. He also worked at Channel 2, wrote a lot of articles for the Sun Papers and National Magazines, and he wrote plays for dinner theaters. You name it, George wrote it. My poor mother, when I was 25 years old and out of college and, and had still not sold anything, not sold anything, you know, she used to wonder if it was ever going to end. She was so patient because I'd get, I'd get so upset you know, when those rejection slips would come in. But I guess I, I just kept doing it because I wanted to do it. All of these classic films on video cassette, Citizen Kane, Casablanca, and all the others, because for the plays he's written, the magazine articles that he's written, for the documentaries he's produced, you see, George Gipe's first love is film, and we're about to experience George Gipe's greatest moment. Of course, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid was George's big break. And what a funny idea, using clips from old movies and adding new material to make an entirely different story. How else could Steve Martin appear in the same movie with so many late, great stars? Don't you think we really ought to get to know each other all over again? And working with these guys, two big names in comedy, Reiner and Steve Martin, what was that like? Do you ever feel a little over your head? What am I doing here? All the time, uh, except uh, I got over it because they're not going to pay their money or invest their future in somebody who they, th they think cannot do it. And they're not charitable institutions. So after a while, I realized I was there for a purpose. You see, they're both performers. I'm a writer, basically. And they're performers and then writers. Uh, very good at both. But they tend to, uh, when they're writing, to perform things. Whereas uh, I'll sit in my room and and performed by myself quietly. So when we were talking out the idea for a script, uh, the biggest danger that faced me was that I'd stop thinking for myself and I'd listen and watch what they did because they were so good, you know. I was at a performance. Uh, Judy, is there anybody with any talent out there? Anybody? Writing talent, specifically. Judy, send Mark across the street and get us a bag of talent, okay? And bring it in here. Bring it in. To work with major creative comedy talents is no, no, hold, such hold a wonderful way to live because what they contribute, they never, they never say, fix it, do something. It's not working. They're saying, 
how about if? And if you're working with a somebody who says, how about if, you've got something to bounce off, something you can say, no, how about, how about this, or yes. One of the climates that we have to establish is that you can't have your ego involved at that moment when you're writing. I mean, I have to feel like I can stand up and say the dumbest thing, because sometimes it'll spark somebody else. They go, hey, well, what if? You know, and you're really feeding each other, and so there's no, you can't have your ego involved at that moment. I'd frame you or kill you if it would protect my daughter. And I brought you a puppy. Something you never had as a boy. Oh, get out. Come on, Ramon. You don't deserve a puppy. Wait! Pick that up. It's all soft and steamy. So all of this success has changed your life, right? Your articles are no. written about you, television comes to talk to you. No. How's it changed your life? I still call my mother and she says, George who? <laughs> no, I, I don't feel, I feel that I'm a, a trivia question, really. Who was the third writer on Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid with, with uh, Steve Martin and Carl Reiner? You know, one hand goes up in the audience. <laughs> you, do you know, sir? And that person says, yeah, it was George Gipp.